So when the critic Harold Bloom read Graham's first collection of poetry, which, which I did the pleasure to publish, uh, The One That Got Away, uh, he spoke of permanence, um, you know, and how, how he expects Graham to, to replicate his career as a scholar and achieve longevity as, as a literary figure. And uh, Russian Kelly, whose, whose debut collection, Rapture, was to my mind one of the, you know, the best books of 2017, uh, you know, she says that, that Graham's words are or what we need to hear in times like these, which, which to my mind is a, is a perfectly apt way of describing his work. You know, very briefly, from a, from a personal perspective, you know, it's, great, it's a great pleasure to introduce these two readers for you know, what is essentially a celebration of our, of our city's great literary tradition. I mean, this may be an international festival, but you know, this is a cork reading here today. Um, you know, we, have, we have two very political poets here. Um, you know, in many ways, I think that we possibly have two of Cork's most explicitly political poets reading together. You know, but beyond politics, the thing that really appeals to me in Graham's work is its use of place. So I like reading, you know, work that is, that is rooted in place, not necessarily explicitly, but in a way that makes you think about the intrinsic sort of emotive qualities of, of our own private world. And I'm always conscious of the, the significance of the most insignificant of places. You know, how a space that is not even one person can mean everything to another. And you find so much of that in Graham's writing. Um, you know, he has this remarkable ability to put you there. You know, reading his work, you can, you can almost see the onboard child in Military Hill, you can almost feel the heat of the Italian sun. And I recently learned about this term corpse paths, which is the idea that all places are dissected by these kind of unseen roads that represent individual memory. And I, I kind of, I suppose I would describe Graham's books as, as collections of corpse paths, and that they take the unseen experience and lay them they them bear before you, or, or at least encourage you to be conscious of, of their presence. And again, his work allows you to kind of confront these things in yourself and the world around you that you might not otherwise be capable of confronting. So, um, you know. Sydney Park, spring 2015, and I read it because it's a poem about beginnings, so it seems a good one to start with. But I read it in Limerick last week, and they said, uh, Sydney Park, you know, they said, um, Con um, um, not Con Creedon, um, John Creedon, the guy that's on the telly. And they all went, oh my God. Sydney Park, 2015. We are coming to the end of winter. Folds of steam are swaggered up from the river hugging splintered town. The sun is returning. Light is well in, spreading itself like water fills a tank. Along the footpath and the walled house gardens, a thousand things I have no words for are being born. I am no field botanist gauging the heliotropic scene. I am not Adam in paradise confronted with the nameless beasts. I am a survivor of the unspecified worst, surprised by my own persistence, shocked by contingency. The last guy I stand in as the credits come down at the end of an old disaster movie. If not from scratch, then still, somehow, we are going to have to start over again. Okay, second, second poem. I'm going to read mostly from the Madhouse system. I have two copies in my bag, <laughs> available at 10 euros each. <laughs> this man has more. <laughs> Please buy them. <laughs> new Binary Press is an important press. It's one of the few new presses in, in Ireland, in the country. I'm going to have to do this terrible, tricky thing of finding my water we are looking. Um, the, way you can, yeah, the way you can support New Binary Press is very simple. You can buy the books. <laughs> So the man is there, go, go to, James is, is brilliant, but he's terrible selling books, so maybe come to me. <laughs> <laughs> Publishers, yeah, shall we? We have one on the desk over there. Yeah, great, good. <laughs> this next poem um, is, this part, I wanted to write a poem that I would read early on in readings about shaking. It's called The Shaking Palsy, which is a book that was written 200 years ago last year, 
which is James Parkinson's book, where he starts to say, well, these people have something in common, because he obviously became Parkinson's disease. Um, it's a poem about what it feels like to have this particular condition, so it's a bit dark, I'm sorry, but allow me. The shaking palsy. Jumbled up rug, dull pin to the city wind, what are you going to do when winter comes? You cannot be calm or cool or still, you cannot sit in prayer or meditation, nothing is rooted or fixed in you. Your hand is twisting and insane music, scattering words to the ground like salt. Sudden gusts of accidental meaning, the hissings of the swollen summer bud. You are tumbling over yourself again, spilling yourself out to your own imagining. Unhinged cabin in need of exorcism. There is a movement nobody can claim. An angel guards you from all quietitude. Overheated, overzealous, starstruck fanatic. Somebody is cutting at the strings. Somebody is tugging at your sleeves. Somebody is tapping you at the ankles, unfolding you into the mysteries of space, hammering you like a lonely church bell. The stars are dancing between your eyes, plunging into a sea of countless stones, peeling off into the ice-prone valleys and the lesser-known haunted spaces of the earth. There is no silence or serenity in you, pitched into a violent re-entry path which never resolves itself into a landing and never quite eventuates in flight. <coughs> Permanent torture of a tightrope walker, Perpetual earthquake, constant tsunami, anti-foundational prophet of disease. You are in denial, but your body is speaking. You are in denial, but your arms make waves. Jumbled up, dragged out, pinned to the city wind. What are you going to do when winter comes? Thank you. I'm not shaking. I thought I would shake less than this because I've got a hell of a lot of drugs inside me at the moment. <laughs> But I'm, I'm shaking a little bit. No, no, no. Anyway, that's a bit what it feels like. That's a bit depressing. So I think I'll, I'll move on to what I call a revenge poem. <laughs> a revenge poem, uh, in particular, re related to um, poetry publishers. <laughs> <laughs> so I find this is quite popular with my poet friends. I wrote this after being rejected by all the major public publishers in the country for my first collection. Which is available and on published by a new writer of the press. <laughs> and it was a bit of a journey, you know? <clears throat> so I thought I'd write one poem in revenge. It's called Letter from an Irish Poetry Publisher. I read through that volume it took you years to write, the one you sweated blood for, the one that cost you your wife, that pensionable job, peace of mind all confidence, and I cannot find one line that speaks to me of anything other than you and your unspecifiable disappointments. There is no music, no lyrical voice, no signature, no tone in any of it. The distant hillsides, the castles and children, the yappy dogs, the constellated sprays of stars, all the lonely women and all the lonely men you have locked and twisted into glimpses seem false and ugly and not worth your own or anyone else's attention. If the book were larger, I'd use it as a doorstop or pack away from my accounts. But it is thin, blunt, tired, and of no utility whatsoever. We're definitely publishing. <laughs> Quote, that's a, it's, not, it's not nasty. It's just a little bit. Okay, it is Valentine's Day. I'm getting married again next year. To so a wonderful woman called Carrie Griffin. Her dad's here, she is not. Her dad's here. And her mother's here as well. <laughs> now, I wrote this poem when Carrie was living in London and I was living in Cork. So we'd swap places. Carrie's often called, she's from Kalani, Kalogla, Carrie. But you know what I mean, we kind of swap places. So it's a poem, I was, I'm trying to channel that kind of Irish poem that laments, that kind of Irish lament about being in the wrong place, or one's loved one being in the wrong place. I wish I was there with you, I wish you were here with me. Many Irish poems, songs like that. So this is what I was trying to do. It's a poem I call Torn. It's nothing to do with Natalie and Bublia, by the way. <laughs> Which I like that song. It's not it's a coincidence. Torn. Now we are lost to each other and you live in that place of skulls where no one laughs and the seas roar lamentations. 
And I remain in the warmth of your parents' house, learning the songs you sang as a girl, reading the books you learned by heart, eating the food that raised you. I wonder how destiny comes to separate what we have made, and why things which should stand true turn inside out. I have written a poem set against the wind that washes us to different shores. It folds us back as poems can against the clock and compass face. It folds us back as poems can into that realm and time denies us. Like a song sung by an old drunk at a wedding, it folds us back. Like a song heard by the harbour wall at midnight by a woman half mad, it folds us back. Like a child hears another child's mother singing it to sleep, it folds us back. As poems can and sometimes will, it folds us back. Okay, so I'm reading Madhouse System poems and three new ones. I've read one new one, which is the Shaking Project. This is the second new one. And this, Pat recently in Facebook, or Twitter, I can't remember, said everyone's got a Trump poem before sharing the world with, sharing with the world his Trump poem. This is my Trump poem. I was going to read a poem by Trump. Because <laughs> there is that book, The Beautiful Poetry of Donald Trump, you may have come across it. Million, at Christmas there were millions of copies of it. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to it. I wonder why. Here's my Trump poem. It's called Inauguration Day. I wrote it on the day, a couple of days afterwards. It wasn't me, I'm not to blame, those people are crazies. You may have a hundred bathrooms, sir, but you've only got one arsehole. <laughs> it must be all some kind of mistake, like opening the gates for a huge wooden GG. Try explaining that to your line manager. It smells so deliciously of lemon and cedar. I met a prof professor who didn't know that the stars were distant suns or that there was any harm in meteorites. I met one student who said she was having problems with Jesus. I told her Jesus was always a problem guy. They are eating us up in Grandong province, dead London, dead Paris, dead Frankfurt, dead Dublin, sci-fi nightmare, vulture capitalism, what's on your mind, what's left in your pockets, where is your karma, quiet haven? Close the blinds, clock the door, turn your mobile to silent, turn off the television, power down your tablet, unplug the radio from the mains, let the whirl of the fridge fill the house, at least you won't see the coverage, ticker tape parade of confederated lunacy. Did you think America would save you? Watch it slash through the great chain of being. The animals are dying like flies. Our children are waiting for Batman to save us. And I am building a wall around my kitchen. I'm building a wall around my soul. And the billionaire sons of gangsters and con men are going to have to pay for it all. I'm expelling all illegals from the homeland of my mind. I'm endeavouring to make Catatonia great again. I'm scouring the map for safe zones and backwaters. I'm practicing the art of Vedic meditation. I'm building a bunker in the hill that bounds the garden. I've buried myself in old sweaters and trousers. I'm growing my hair to blend in with the hedges. I am a hat stand. I am a shadow. I'm closing my frontiers, shutting down my runways. America is a nightmare from which I am attempting to awake. So I've been teaching William Blake recently, not the first years, which has been a joy really. Um, I thought about, you know, what would William Blake be writing about nowadays, teaching the songs to innocence and experience. So he gets very cross about chimney sweeper boys, doesn't he? You know, boys of the age of ten. But, uh, sorry, that is. Um, boys at the age of ten put up chimneys. They used, to, they used to go up naked, you know, and um, they used to light fires underneath them so they'd go up quick, you know. Um, what a terrible society. This poem's called Head Down, and it's dedicated to Alan Curdy. They turned you into a photograph, an image of damage, and everyone who had ever had a child, or ever been a child, mourned. People spoke of outrage, betrayal, charity, and war. 
the internet buzzed and pulsed and crackled. Prayers were raised, analysis delivered. Everyone opened their eyes and extended their vision, considering the homeless, the exiled and dispossessed. But nothing changed, and nothing ever will. But I believe it will, hopefully. Okay, two more poems. This is slightly better, but it has language in it, Susan. There's two children over there who mean quite a lot to me, actually. Um, the last line of this poem, you're going to have to go like that. Can you do that? I don't know how I'm going to do There's a bit of language right at the end. This is a new poem. And this, this, the, the events of this poem actually happened. Although I've changed names and I've even changed the group involved. Just to make it a bit more general. And it's kind of autobiographical poem in a way. It's creative non-fiction. It's called Concentrate. Elvis Costello and the attractions of bringing lipstick vogue to a spitting crescendo in a dark cabinet's working men's club somewhere in Middle England. And you are looking into the death mask of the future as the tiny Asian girl you promise to keep safe and always by your side goes floating off. Her hands and arms in violent fits above the blind direction as heads of Mohican giants in white beater vests and swastika heel pants. This is now serious. You will never see her again. You will be held responsible by people you hate, by cool Marxist teachers you like and always fail to impress. Innocence is fading before your eyes. Sacrifice to the lusts of apolitical menace and pure spite. The glorious fashion of an awakened beast, devouring more than you can save and more than you can care about. But you should do something. You should give a damn. You should fight against the tide that is washing her beyond your compass. Despite the thumping voice at the centre of your head, making triangles of consciousness with your eyes and your ears that are collapsing into spasms of joy as the drums tumble into themselves again and again, and the green spotlighted face of the grinning demon holding a microphone looks with utter contempt beyond the sea of writhing bodies below him and shouts out of the darkness. Sometimes I even feel just like a human being. It's you, and you know this your time and your youth and your podgy, a burning creative being, crushed tight like a diamond into a frantic roll of venom and syncopation and rapturous singularity. There will never be another geek like this. There will never be another time like this. This is the one epicenter you will experience, the one point you and yours will rule the world. Music will be hijacked by suited bureaucrats with pre-programmed computer loops and catalogued blondes with corrupted misty eyes. And you will be damned to live in a hell of unimaginable and cost-effective music, nostalgic for this moment of pure fear loathing, epiphany, supercharged adrenaline, a fully unveiled, ecstatic, one-fingered genius. Hmm. You saw her at the station just before boarding the late train back to London, attached to a hand twice the size of her head, and smiling like a sunny afternoon after weeks of rain. Jesus, she said, that was fucking amazing. <laughs> That's the last line. Sorry, sorry kids. <laughs> One more poem, then I'll let you, I'll release you. I said last week in Limerick, this is going to end up like my um, stairway to heaven. It's not yet, but I can foresee the day when I'm sick of reading this, but I'm not sick of reading it yet. It's had a certain success, let's put it that way, like an open book. Parkinson's disease is quite different. It affects your reading, you know. I mean, noise outside the window affects your reading, but this affects your reading. I get over it. This poem is a poem I wrote very soon after the death of my hero, David Bowie. And Patrick over there is sporting the David Bowie Let's Dance t-shirt, which, which, which I, I consider to be support for this poem. <laughs> well, this was radio, uh, RT poem of Poem of the Week in December 2016, which I was very proud. So I'd written something um, in some way to express what I felt about David Bowie. It's called Bright Star, Elegy for David Bowie. His lips recoil from the taste of the real. His eyes look through to the earliest stars. Outside your mind is his best imagining. He's paved our footpath with tiny, tiny pearls. 
He smokes his cigarette like an ivory pen, his fingers caressing the shoulders of ghosts. He wears his suit like a mannequin would, only with more perpetual purpose. Beyond his profile and down by the lakeside where heavenly metal pianos play, angels in fur coats stand to attention as the skies collapse into orange flame. The man with the clipboard said he was dead and all of our colours faded to dust. The shrill pantheon of matinee gods shrugged their shoulders as if passing the buck. Everyone wept and put stones in their mouths. Newsmen and newswomen read LJ verse. The internet stuck up a tearful emoticon and old men buried their hands in the earth. Far away beyond blue filtered shorelines where devils leaf through prohibited texts and children dance at midnight unattended, his spirit rose like a passing comet. And we said, as all the museums caught fire and politicians wept into their fists, he is as far beyond us now as he ever was, bright star making a halo of the darkness. We could hear the new, new music of the spheres. You can listen to his eternity from here. It says, do everything with joy, do everything with love, do everything as if the world was still fixable. Raise your head above the crowd, then help the crowd to rise up too. Smile brilliantly into the future. Smile brilliantly at the camera of your death. Imitate the life of the sun, imitate the lives of the moon. Honestly face your demons down. Shine like a light that has no source, save for its own irrepressible desires. Invent a galaxy you can live in. Reinvent what it means to have a face. Burn brightly. Burn beautifully. Burn through the inconvenience of time. Burn through the inadequacies of space. Burn through the lone splendors of philosophy. Burn like every fresh-faced new kid on the block. Burn like the force that sweeps through the universe. Burn your way back to the star stuff that made you. Burn like the singular point of all energy. Burn like an absolute image of release. Thank you very much. Thanks very, very much for that lovely introduction. 
Um, I'm going to begin with a longish poem, and uh, some of you may have heard it before. Uh, it's the title of the poem for this collection, which by a curious coincidence is on sale over here, um, after the show. Um, this uh, poem uh, originated when uh, going down to visit my parents' graves some years ago. Uh, I glanced as I passed through the village of Whitegate where our house used to be and found it was gone. Now we had sold it, the family had sold it many years before, so uh, you know, uh, it was long out of my, my uh, kind of immediate ken, you know. But it's still a big shock to, to find uh, that the house that you grew up in has gone, and especially to discover that um, it blew up. Um, you know, I imagine if you lived in London in World War II, uh, or perhaps even in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, it would be something that you could maybe fear anyway. But uh, to, for it to happen in peacetime is a real shock, and it took me a long time to come to terms with it. And um, one of the ways that I, I come to terms with things in my life is by writing about them. Um, so this is a, an attempt to come to terms with uh, what that house meant to me. And uh, it's, I suppose, mainly about my parents and uh, about an aunt and an uncle who uh, lived with us off and on. Um, the Yellow House. <clears throat> Someone blew up the Yellow House. It was no surprise. It should happen to everyone. The past is an animal burrowing inside out. Yesterday, it was autumn and the kingdom of bank managers. They were kings and waiting and someone blew up the house where I grew up. Yesterday there were leaves on the trees and people coming and going as if there were places, origins and destinations, and love was yesterday in the way that childhood was yesterday and all that stuff about our fellow man, and today is for the kindness of markets, regrets and dividends. Someone blew up the yellow house, a fag end was the charge, light of my life, in which everyone died except me. The sea comes and goes at the door, bringing rats and uncles, sailors at a jaunty angle, and occasionally ants to the yellow house. Trouble, trouble, my father leaves early and works late all that summer, potatoes and saving the hay and anything else he can think of, mending fences, taking the horse to water. In those days there were horses. And nothing of the world impresses me so much as the size of my aunt's suitcase and the huge variety of clothes it contains that she never wears. Because whatever we have, we wear it all. And when she goes, she leaves some that my mother never wears, some kind of surplus in the yellow house, like the way my father never plows the headlands but never leaves them to seed either, and how they ache in broken mud in summer. And my uncle comes, after a rough crossing, 1939 to 45, he was a mutineer at Invergordon when the Navy rose, an always bolshy boy, coming home to die with a brown suitcase, and die he did, as they are wont to do, snuffed it in terrible pain or oblivion, depending on where you say the man ended and the pain began. And he was a ladies' man, often married, never churched. He lifted his hat, good morning, ma'am, evenings too on his way to the pub, would steam up getting his chemo from a pint glass and a short. Fire below, Bill Boy. Ruddy boiler is blown. It's Davy Jones for me. Oh, Davy Jones. This room is full of dead people, my father said to me. In the hospital ward, we were alone. I saw fear where his valium should be. His father died of anemia when he was 12 years old. The graves of Cork Beg and Ahada the names of the long gone people he sold cattle to in the prehistory of them. His comical watching empty places, his finger pointing. The doctors moved like thunder to cancel the numinous, a new prescription. And the dead went down like Christians into the holes assigned. And my father in the land of the living held his ground and took his time, whistling and crying and longing for the day when we brought him home to the yellow house. My father hoisted me onto his shoulders when I could walk no more. 
We were going into the long hours before lights, and we were beyond lights anyway. It was one of those times before memory, the way behind us already fading to black. The beginning of things, or the end of beginnings, with hours to cockcrow and all that goes that road. And the time came when we exchanged places handy dandy, me for him and him for me, and I carried him to his grave on my foolish shoulders, the way behind us fading to black, the hour of cockcrow and all that goes that road. And my mother, never a big eater after my father died, starved herself to death for lonesomeness, a seamstress and a natty dresser. She wore high collars, loved the yellow house. Oh, love was yesterday in the way time was yesterday. So much pain, the last thing she said, or the last thing I remember. She went out like a light, unstitched her life, traveling fingers, unwinding winding sheets, picking at clothes, unpicking the fabric of the world until only the bones remain. They had bones and collars then, and stiffer backs, but they bent and broke together, bent and broke together, and desolation settlement came to the yellow house. Down there, at the fractal edge of knowing water and world, I passed on the road to my parents' grave and saw nothing where the house should be. A development, opportunity, a gap in the teeth of the rising gale, a shock to the system, windows like gun bays, creaking doors, switches my father fitted upside down, never to be thrown again, a whole roof of clean slates, a cast iron kitchen range and timber wainscoting, now air and angels, all that was once a yellow house. The past is a cracker, a catherine wheel, a bomb in the best of places, a mine in the heart. Here is the truth, a store of bottled gas, a perfect bomb, and someone tossed a fag end or a match, that casual aplomb, and boom, someone blew up the yellow house. And that's actually how it happened. Uh, the man who bought it from us uh, was storing gas there, and um, uh, he was pretty well disliked. And whether somebody deliberately <clears throat> tossed a match in or a fag end or whatever. In any case, the whole thing went up. Um, so here's uh, um, another poem about the same house. Uh, our house was at sea level. People to the right of us were below sea level. People to the left of us were above sea level. And uh, we couldn't get insurance for flood, of course. Um, but I remember, I can remember the sea. Uh, I can remember backing up the stairs in front of the sea on two occasions, you know. Um, our house flooded from the sea when I was a boy. I remember backing up the stairs step by step in curiosity as the tide came in. Sea level was our threshold and, f and flood flushed out rats from the foreshore, wood lice and crabs, old Tom Hogwood, ex-sailor, DC's lemonade and bass bottles and bladder rack, something unpleasant from underneath the floorboards. Next day, the misery of everything, waiting for a dry hour. The insurance company said, fire, but not flood. The irony of it, time burned it to the ground where it stood. So maybe that's a revenge poem, Graham, you know, against insurance companies, which we would all like to have our revenge on, I think. Um, the next poem, um, you'll uh, probably remember, uh, I think it was in 2010, December the 1st, I think it was, 2010, uh, a man called Jonathan Corey died in Dublin. He was, he had been, he was a rough sleeper, um, and uh, uh, at the time, the uh, Prime Minister had gone on a fact-finding mission to uh, investigate homelessness in Dublin and wanted to run greeting homeless people, and that's the occasion of this poem. They're still homeless, unfortunately. It's called The Ballad of the Crombie Coat. A minister, a government minister, in a country not far, set out one night on a quest with his armed police guard and his trusty PR, in search of the people, the homeless people, on a pilgrimage of grace and the press. And to do good, surely, said Jonathan Corrie. 
And he looked on the doorsteps of the big corporations, marble and glass and underfloor heating, and he knew them already. He goes in by the front door, and there he found people, more or less homeless people. Sure, we're sleeping in doorways, said Jonathan Curry. They were sleeping on cardboard, soup from the Simon, a winter's night and bitter at that, the wind on the river dying, a promise of frost. And the minister wore crumbly, hands in his pockets. Who could blame him? Not me, surely, said Jonathan Curry. Oh, a young man gone in the head died in a doorway of a cold night. Not the same night, and not the same doorway. And people brought flowers, they that never brought flowers the twenty odd years he was dying. No worries. But look, I could do with the crumbie, said Jonathan Curry. Um, this one um, is actually very personal to me, uh, but um, is not about me, I hasten to add, because I don't, uh, I don't play a bridge if I'm not a member of a golf club. <coughs> so that's the denial. Um, it's about uh, how people of my generation have seen their uh, children uh, in a way stricken by the um, by the crisis crises I should say <coughs> of capitalism in Ireland um, we have uh, nephews and nieces living as far away as Tasmania um, until recently both of my kids lived in England uh, now one of them has found work back in Dublin which we're delighted about but it's about that and it's called I'm alright Jack I am the generation of the trades union and workers' rights, paid holidays and pensions, and that's partly because we fought for it, and partly because we didn't fight hard enough, and now our kids have precarious labour, zero hours contracts, permanent emigration, and the planet is burning under their feet because we had Sunday spins and motoring holidays, oil fired central heating, terrilene, crimpline, and drip dry, plastic packaging, single glazing, built in obsolescence, and the cost of their son. And our kids are all in Australia now, or over the water. It's the house we built, Jack. We never saw it coming. A future without a future, their future full of our past. Thatcher and Reagan and their children and their children's children are not in distress. No bailiff at their door. But I'm all right, Jack. I play golf on Tuesday and bridge on a Friday night. And I vote for the local man, no matter who he is or what he stands for. Because loyalty counts. In what currency? None of us knows. And of course, there's Skype. I watch my grandson growing up like he was on television. The unreality show of all shows. Can you believe it's happening, Jack? But I'm all right. We're in recovery now, they say, and maybe they'll all come back our lost children. But this is no fairy tale and no Pipe Piper stole them from us. Or at least none that we saw or heard. So I'm all right, Jack. I'll be all right in the end. Maybe we trusted too much that what we were told was true. We were taught to respect our elders and betters, tipping our caps to the church and the teacher, the doctor, the boss. They knew better. But look where respect brought us. This solitary desolation, this childless desert, this hole in the heart. There's no going back. We should have burned them out, priest, doctor, priest, teacher, doctor, and boss, and kept our children close. Then we'd be all right, Jack. Then we'd be all right. Um, um, you get interviewed periodically. Um, you, when a book comes out, there's usually kind of a rash of interviews to be done, you know. And sometimes they can be really interesting, and sometimes they can be utterly stupid. And this is um, a response to uh, one of the utterly stupid ones. It's caught on being interviewed. Do I worry that the bank is in earth fall? That my life insurance is anal retentive? That I won't be around to collect anyway? That entrepreneurs are unloved? That this is the country of begrudgery or that there is no respect for property? The short answer is no. Do I worry that the police are too gentle? that torturers feel left out of the Geneva Conventions, that avian flu is about to go terrestrial, that shoppers are afraid of closure, that organic may not always be? The short answer is no. Bird nesting is late this year. There are cameras on every street. 
My sons were beaten in London by the police. They want to sell our drinking water to some corporation of bastards. I get letters from people who don't know my name, but I'm dropped from the register of electors by mistake. Each year, 80,000 people emigrate. I am free to come or go because I'm white, best blessed by the law and the police. Evictions proceed apace. Asymmetric war means more brown people die, but we only miss the white. We grieve for our dead, but not for our kills, our long-range terminal goodwill. And I am supposed to have a short answer. The short answer is no. So this is Valentine's Day anyway. And by a curious coincidence, it's all also Ash Wednesday. So all those sad poems are dedicated to the Ash Wednesday part of today. Um, and uh, now we'll have a couple of love poems. I would know your step. I would know your step, the set of your shoulders, the way you hold your head if you walked across the horizon three miles distant, wherever they have horizons, steps, or deserts. I would know your step. I would know your voice if you stood in a choir of voices in the world's biggest choral anthem, some unimaginable alleluia in the biggest cathedral on the horizon of a step or desert. I would know your voice. I would know your hair in a curiosity shop of copper, in a chest of chestnuts, in a goldsmith's workshop, your red gold hair in a cathedral of copper and gold on the horizon of a step or desert. I would know your hair. I would know the sounds you make in sleep the noise of your dreams, if you were the chorus of a great cathedral, or the copper in a wire, the curiosity of goldsmiths on the horizon of a step or desert, I would know the song. And that's uh, dedicated to my wife, Liz, who has red hair, um, hence all the references to copper, which of course I could never say to her face that she's got a copper head, you know. Uh, <laughs> This poem is called Vortex. Um, your handbag is a vortex into which everything disappears. The best virals, the ones that still write, and also some that don't. The car keys, the dog, all our yesterdays. The London Review of Books, your alpaca jumper that I love, your mobile, on silent. And the vortex itself, self-devouring a black hole in the universe and a handful of dead stars. I never touch the inside, the unbearable gravity, the siren call of falling. But one day I will, and spin down there among the things you said you had when we needed them, even though we never found them. I'm sorry for not believing that you had them all along. <laughs> Handbags. <laughs> they are really um, um, a different country and they do things differently in there. <laughs> <clears throat> in darkness we are inflamed. In darkness we are inflamed. Begin with touch, be led, be led. Eyes closed, heart opened, pressed to this ship or bed. A noisy gale, salt on the skin, turn by turn our calls and cries, all hands pressed to this ship or bed. In darkness we are inflamed, first with whispers, hands and tongues, begin with hands pressed to this ship or bed. Um, what am I doing for time, Pat? I haven't been keeping tabs out. Five minutes. Five minutes, great. So this poem is called The Ten Best Places to Write a Poem. Um, there are excellent places to write a poem, medium good places to write a poem, and there are very bad places to write a poem. Uh, this is a little known fact to people who are in the early days of writing poetry, but you find it out soon enough, you know? But they're always personal to everybody, to each individual person. And for all I know, they may be the best place to read poems as well. 
These are my 10 best places to write a poem. And I advise anybody to try them, by the way. On a footstool in the ladies' laundry department. On a tomb in the Protestant cemetery. Under the television in the railway station bar. In the back of a high ace van at a red light on a Sunday. In a diving bell. In a large old suitcase stamped Rio with a flashlight. In a cherry tree among the blackening cherries. On a brakeless bicycle going down. In the basket of an escaped balloon. In someone else's underpants. Wherever the tenure is uncertain, where the carnal and the hasty rule okay. <clears throat> and um, uh, I'm sure you know that, uh, that nobody makes a living from uh, poetry. And so this is a poem about uh, the things poets do for a living. I read this in America recently to a group of um, undergraduate uh, literature students and they didn't know any of the names. I was actually shocked. Wallace Stevens was in insurance and John Berryman taught classes and seduced people. Nice work if you can get it. And Tom Elliott was at favour, of course, and Larkin was in the library and Auden was in everything, including almost the war, and Dylan Thomas was in the BBC and other people's pockets. And Cavafy was in the irrigation service. And Frost was in farming, until the arse fell out of his farm, and then of course it was teaching. Sylvia Plath had Ted Hughes and the gas. And Ted Hughes had several others, and later a farm. And Walt, Walt Whitman was a newspaper man. Marianne Moore wrote line notes for Muhammad Ali. And Cavafy was in the irrigation service. And Spaziani was in the uni of Messina, and Brecht was in theatre and the Soviet Union, and Transformer was a shrink, Quasimodo was in the Corps of Engineers, and William Carlos Williams was a doctor, Pessoa was a clerk, and Anne Sexton modelled for the Heart Agency, and Cavafy was in the Irrigation Service. It started with that line, actually, that Cavafy was in the Irrigation Service, which I think is just perfect. A <laughs> uh, very short poem, and then I'll finish with uh, um, the last poem in the book. This is called The Ship of Theseus, and uh, I'm sure you know that the, the Greeks so treasured the Ship of Theseus that uh, whenever a piece decayed, they replaced it until eventually uh, none of the original remained, and the question was, was it still the ship of Theseus, you know? Um, one of those old kind of um, philosophical conundrums, you know? The ship of Theseus. I know so little about who I am that I write from the prejudice of the moment in the hope of finding where I stand. And like the ship of Theseus, everything changes day by day until nothing remains. I remake myself in every new phrase. And this last poem is called Lament for the Yellow House. Um, <coughs> this is Van Gogh's Yellow House um, at Arles, uh, which was destroyed by Allied bombing during the Second World War in, in 1944, in fact. Uh, completely unnecessarily because there were no Germans there at the time. Um, but uh, anyway, it was destroyed and no longer exists. And it's a kind of, in a way, it bookends, you know, the, the first Yellow House poem is the first poem in the book, and this is the, this is the last poem in, in the book, and uh, there are kind of similarities about, about how I think and how I write about them. So this is divided into several parts, so I would call out each part as I go through it. <clears throat> and, and before I go, thanks very much for being a fantastic audience. What is a house aside from its inhabitants, the intensity of things, onions, candles, kettles, bottles, pipes, wine, pipe tobacco, of course. A book too, people must be accommodated, poor cracked Vincent, netting light with jute and paint, sunflowers with purple eyes on a yellow table, a blue enameled iron coffee pot, a royal blue jug, a blue majolica cup, 
gaslight at 25 francs and overhead the suffering sun, the sulfur moon. We take death to reach a star, he said, as we take trains, cobalt the sky, sulfur the storm. Arl in the summertime before the bad, bad days. We know ourselves in things, but are unknowable. Nothing of us remains in the things we own, the things we make, the curious trailing jetsam of our wake. Two. The Trancatai Bridge, the train from Lunel, the night cafe, Place Lamartine, these are not things but appearances. Cobalt the sky, sulfur the storm. You work in surfaces, attentive to roughness, the vanishing edge, fabric and frame and pattern, the fatal imminence of the unreal world, cobalt the sky, sulfur the stone, cobalt from self for the porcelain sky, cadmium red for a whore's dress, the chrome yellow wood, the lead white clouds, old ochres and violets, cobalt the sky, sulfur the stone. Three. The roam comes to occupy your place, to eat your canvas, to dissolve your paint. Red pigment lets you down, violet fading to blue. Time, time, and sulfur, mercury, cadmium, all the poisons and the loose edges of the real and untrue. The way paint takes on jute, losing itself in the fibres. You paint from the real, your best work, even as the world breaks like a rotten chair, limb from limb, the joints and fastenings, whatever it means to be complete. And still the starry nights and cypresses, the almond blossoms, harvesters and gleaners, and bloody vines. Four. I want to walk my yellow house, the crooked room, the crooked floor. Give me back my things of air, my yellow bed, my yellow chair. I dream of paint and linseed oil, of turpentine, of morning light. Give me back my things of air, my yellow bed, my yellow chair. That crooked room inside my head, the shape of my heart. I think as though of the world as off true. Give me back my things of air, my yellow bed, my yellow chair. Five. <coughs> Up the bush at noon they come from Corsica to hit the bridge, the Lunel line crossing the Rhone. A hundred bombs at least, a thousand pounds apiece. A good pattern on the bridge and the approach. The road to Mont Major. Place Lamartine erupts, the trees of the park shudder or burn, the gas pipe blows. This is Provence that you invented. You loved it once, you dreamed the light a day in June. The sun came up in your bedroom as it did in 88. The town awoke, the river went its way, there was a war. Not here. The sadness will last forever, so you said. All the grey dead, a line of ash, horizons of it. Wheat field with bombers and burning stars, the suffering sun, cobalt the sky, sulfur the stone, red pigment bleeding <coughs> down the leaden clouds, and someone blew up the yellow house. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.